Um, so I think you heard a lot from Lydia uh, um, this morning who, who gave the welcome address, this idea that this conference is quite unusual. We've had an intergenerational conference organizing committee. So I guess if Lydia, with the greatest respect, she would be the grandmother, self-professed. Um, I guess I'm probably kind of like one of the dads. And then we're gonna hear from the next generation coming through in this session. Um, and a, a big kind of reason why we're here today um, is a, an organization called Teach the Future. Um, they were really inspiring to us. And um, we're gonna introduce Eleanor later on in this session, who's gonna tell you a lot more about what they're doing. Um, but I'm sure you're aware that young people have been, have been trumpeting the climate issue very vociferously and very effectively um, in the last two to three years. Uh, pioneered, of course, by, by Greta, but there are thousands of Gretas out there. In fact, there are tens of thousands of Gretas out there. There are hundreds of thousands of them. Um, and their voice in this issue is very poignant and we have to listen. Um, but not only do we listen, um, we, we act. Uh, and a big kind of thinking that I want you to have in mind today um, as you listen to these inspiring speakers is what can I do? It's not fair to leave this to the shoulders of young people to carry this responsibility. So as teachers, as, as educators, what can we do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to wrestle with this issue and tackle with it in, in practical ways? So that's enough of my, my pattern. Let me kind of begin by introducing um, our, our first speakers. So we're delighted to be, to be welcomed by, uh, or rather be joined by Marion and Pooja. Um, and they are uh, uh, members of a, an amazing organization called Climate Emergency Manchester. Who are gonna, you're going to hear a lot of it, uh, a lot about um, in their speech. So Marion, to begin with, uh, she's, a, she's a writer. Hi, Marion, a writer, a musician, um, an ethnomusicology master's student at uh, the University of Manchester. Her research interests are largely concerned with the musical activity amongst marginalised communities, with a particular focus on Manchester and the north of England. Uh, as well as the role of musical and artistic movements within the spheres of social justice. Uh, incredibly fascinating uh, uh, backstory. Look, looking forward to hearing more about that, Marion. And we're also going to be joined uh, uh, by Pooja, uh, who's a final year undergraduate student pursuing a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics at the University of Manchester. Her research interests include urban climate change, governments, environmental racism, and institutional and non institutional forms of climate justice. So, without further ado, over to Marion and to Pooja to talk us through their presentation. Oh. Hi, thank you so much. Um, is it okay if I start sharing my screen now? Is that all right? Fab. Um, okay. And present. I'm hoping you can see this because um, I can't see anything on Zoom now. <laughs> I'm hoping this is working. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. We're really, really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Marion, as we said, um, I'm a musician, a writer, an ethnomusicology master's student. Ethnomusicology is basically like the anthropology of music, just in case you're wondering. Um, and then Pooja is a PPE student and we're both at the University of Manchester and part of Climate Emergency Manchester, which is this organisation that exists mainly to connect citizens in Manchester who are concerned about climate change. So a lot of the stuff that we focus on is trying to like hold the council and other large institutions to account uh, for their action or I guess often inaction as well on climate change. Um, we're also really concerned with advocating for and trying to demonstrate better emotional processing of the effects of the climate crisis, which is which has a lot to do with what we're here to talk about today. Um, just before I start as well, I, I know that it's difficult at times in talks like this, when especially when you've had like however amazing conferences when you've been on a call all day um over zoom i know it can be like quite difficult to stay engaged sometimes um and especially when you've got like such a big audience and uh, we can't make this talk as interactive as possible so if you would like in some way to involve yourself with a form of engagement with us um i'd like to invite you if you want um to grab a pen and paper and this isn't something that we're going to check so don't worry um but if you want to grab a pen and paper and write down first of all the first thing that you think of when you hear the words climate change and then throughout our talk maybe one question that you have about climate change and the education sector that might arise from the things we're going to talk about this could be something for us to answer but just as amazingly if it's something that you can go away and think about as well that would be brilliant um we hope that this talk will leave you with questions that you can explore like beyond this conference um but yeah equally we'd 
be really happy to chat to you about anything about what we said in the Q&A as well. Um, okay, so without further ado, <laughs> um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about climate justice, which is a really intrinsic part of our work. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you are aware that climate justice is a social justice issue because the disproportionate effects of the climate crisis fall on working class communities and communities of colour the most. So like climate change doesn't exist in a vacuum. So neither should the climate movement or our climate activism associated with it, right? Um, there's more recognition, I think, that's slowly developing in the understanding that the climate crisis disproportionately impacts people who live in the global south. But I think what's discussed less is that there's also a massive discrepancy in the effects of climate change in this country as well. So I have a couple of examples of this. Um, the first would be um, the repeated flooding that happens in the Calder Valley. If you don't know where that is, that's halfway between um, Leeds and Manchester in West Yorkshire. Uh, and basically the communities there um, face flooding either like every couple of years, if not more frequently than that. And it can cause like severe damage to homes and livelihoods. Um, I forgot to change my slide. Um, so this, this flooding happens obviously because of the effects of climate change. But the reason that the community there is still facing this problem is because there still aren't adequate de flooding defense mechanisms that are put in place to protect them, right? Um, I guess as well, like a really quite horrifying example is um, the death of nine-year-old Ella Kissy Deborah, who was a black child who lived in Southeast London. So she died in 2013 and her death has recently become the first in the UK to be attributed solely to air pollution exposure. So this is obviously incredibly tragic and it's a pretty horrifying instance of the way that environmental racism continues to happen here in our country. So the key point here is that climate change is not a distant threat that have just affects people elsewhere in the world or animals or biodiversity. Although to be fair, the amount of depictions in the media that you get of like polar bears and Amazon rainforest fires are so like dominating in media's discussions on climate change. Like you may well think otherwise from that. Uh, but yeah, essentially vulnerable and poor communities in the UK also bear these disproportionate burdens. And this will continue to happen at increasingly alarming race as the climate crisis exacerbates. So that's why urgent consideration and action on climate is absolutely necessary and really urgent. And the reason why I've opened this talk with this is because for everyone in attendance here, there will probably be people here who are likely experiencing these disproportionate burdens too. And in your professional careers as teachers, right, you're very likely to encounter children and students and people who are also affected. And these are people who not only may need additional support in their emotional processing of climate change, but also need centering in the conversations and movements that are taking place. Um, so with that said, I'm going to hand over to Pooja, who's going to talk a little bit about our work and the concept of capacity building. Thanks, Marion. So as Marion already briefly introduced you to the work that we do at Climate Emergency Manchester, which is essentially to hold the council and local institutions accountable and also to make citizens more aware about climate inaction. So what that's that's basically our core goals at Climate Emergency Manchester. And over the last year, we've published se several reports which scrutinize the council's progress on their climate goals or their inaction since they declared a climate emergency in 2019. And a common thread through all of our projects is our focus on capacity building. So no matter what project or work that we're focusing on, we're really concerned with how we can retain obtain and improve the skills and knowledge that will ultimately make us better climate activists. And I think a really good example of one such project that we've undertaken last year is our petition to campaign for a seven scrutiny committee devoted to climate change and the environment. So just to give you some more information about this, so the Manchester City Council has six scrutiny committees and all of them are focused on different areas. So the one that the committee that talks about climate change is the Neighborhoods and Environment Committee. But the problem is that this committee barely engages with issues around the climate crisis. So just last year, they spent less than three hours discussing issues surrounding the climate crisis. And we think that this is very inadequate. And so last year, as a group, we collectively voted to facilitate a petition to campaign for a seventh scrutiny committee. And this petition was largely done through the city council's petition portal, 
which meant that we had to get over 4,000 signatures by November so that we could get the executive members of the council to debate a motion for a seven scrutiny committee and discuss whether this could be implemented. So from the very beginning, we knew that this was a difficult task because reaching 4,000 signatures is quite hard. But I think that it became even more unlikely after March because it turns out trying to collect signatures during a global pandemic is unsurprisingly difficult. So we reached a point where we were discussing whether we should carry on or no, but we decided to go forward anyway because we figured that even if we didn't reach the 4,000 target, we could still cause enough of a stir about the petition and also make members of the public more aware of the city council's processes and their inaction on climate change. So here's where capacity building really comes in because this petition campaign was a great opportunity for us as a co-group to develop a variety of skill sets, whether that's social media campaigning or advertisement methods, video editing, graphic design, and I think most importantly, just formulating a campaign that is actually effective and cohesive. So as you may have gathered, we didn't really meet our target, although we really think that we would have reached it were it not for the COVID pandemic. But during the entire course of the campaign, and even as a result of it, we've developed a vast range of skills. And since most of us were just campaigning from home most of the time, we also formed a petition task force, which comprised of our core group, but also members of the public. And these were our supporters based in Manchester. And this exponentially improved the work that we were able to do. And this is really a model that we will continue in the future. So the reason why I'm sharing more information about this particular petition campaign is just to highlight the fact that capacity building is vital to sustain morale throughout an important project. And this is especially important in the context of building a movement for climate action. At the end of the year, when we reflected on our strengths and weaknesses, we realized that we could not have worked on the petition or any of the other projects that we undertook without supporting each other and being aware of our limitations and most importantly, just taking breaks in order to avoid burning out. Because if there's something that you'll commonly notice is that many climate activists tend to burn out. And this is because you can feel quite isolated, like the problem just seems so huge and unsolvable. But here's where capacity building once again comes in. It's important to sustain your individual morale, but also a group morale. And because of the capacity building that took place during the petition campaign, I think we've come to become a much stronger and more influential group than we were last year. And this is something that we're really proud of. So we didn't reach our plan target, but we've already started thinking about the next steps in our campaign. And this is something that you can also get involved in as audience members. And I will be sharing more information about this towards the end of our talk. But before that, I'll just head back, I'll ha hand it back over to Marion just to talk a little more about the school curriculum. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, so um, I've, I've heard that so far today you've had some really amazing conversations about school curriculums and the climate crisis and um, I wasn't there, so forgive me if I'm repeating anything, but I'm hoping that in some way I can bring in maybe a slightly different perspective into this, we'll see. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start with a statement that's maybe a little, sounds a little bit dramatic, but I'll explain why, and that's that the school curriculum is failing students in relation to climate change. And there's a number of different components to this, right? So the first is that although climate change is something that permeates all aspects of our lives in, so in schools, like students are largely taught about climate change in science and STEM orientated classes and geography classes as well, right? So if school curriculums are supposed to educate students across many different fields and disciplines, then the climate crisis is definitely not reflected across all aspects of the curriculum. And when this is the case, you immediately lose the attention and the engagement of students who maybe aren't interested or aren't confident in science-based subjects. 
So then the second issue is that school curriculums aren't designed to teach students that the climate crisis impacts people. So from early years learning, right, children are taught to associate climate change with ecosystems and the Arctic and the Antarctic and penguins and starving polar bears and this kind of stuff, which that's just very important. But that's, that's most of the thing that people know. Um, and that makes it harder to conceptualize for people that climate change affects a disproportionate number of people both throughout the world, but also them themselves as well. So what's possibly most concerning of all of this is that the curriculum doesn't give children space to process their emotions on climate change, because here in the global north, climate change isn't treated as something that will affect, does affect, and will continually affect each and every one of us at increasingly alarming rates. So that's why in this respect, the curriculum sets children up to fail when many of them become aware of the climate crisis in later life. So there's obviously some generalizations in what I'm saying here, but I can tell you that there are some truths in it. And I can explain this through a personal anecdote because this happened to me. So in school, I was always really interested in the arts and humanities, like went on to like do music, these kind of subjects. Um, and I didn't really consider myself to be very much good at maths or science, which really marred my confidence in STEM subjects just throughout all the time I was in school. And because of these interests that I had, the curriculum told me that like the climate change, science type stuff just didn't really have much to do with me. Um, like I wasn't taught that climate change could affect me and other people like me. And obviously this is a really privileged position to be in in a lot of ways, to go about the world unaware for any given time that this is a massive crisis that's affecting people. Um, but this meant that I got to university age and through one way or another became very aware very quickly and very terrifyingly about the impacts and eventualities and effects of climate change and this was like quite like an existentially frightening but also very isolating process because there were a lot of very intense emotions that I had to process on my own and this isn't to say that everyone will go through this like monumental emotional sea change right like there's a not there's quite a lot of denialists out there you may have met some um i know i have um there's also people with their heads buried like far too deep in the sand to ever really fully acknowledge the kind of level of devastation that we're talking about but a lot of people do go through this process i'm sure that there's a lot of people here who also have and a lot of children at some point in ever will go through this as well whether whilst they're still in school or maybe throughout their adolescence or throughout their adulthood so this is like a big problem in a lot of ways um i know this is starting to sound like very depressing so don't worry um but there are some positive opportunities here as well so like arts education in schools although I'm fully and very keenly aware that arts education is under intense amounts of pressure. It is also uniquely placed to help children with provide, well, to provide children with a space to process their emotions on the climate crisis, especially because climate change has historically been absent from the arts and humanities in comparison to STEM type subjects. And also because we consider the arts to be such a powerful medium for expression. The other thing as well is that students need spaces to critically engage with the material that they're consuming. So there's figures such as like David Attenborough, who is brilliant in some ways, um, absolutely dominate climate education, right? Whereas many other voices and views are overlooked and that really isn't talked about enough, I don't think. Um, a really a popular way that I was taught about climate change when I was in school was to watch David Attenborough documentaries essentially as like a fact finding exercise with no real critique or analysis as to what's actually being presented. So I don't know, maybe an alternative to this would be as in schools would be children watching these documentaries. Um, but instead of just learning about like dying polar bears or whatever, however important that is, like there could be critical engagement that takes a form of a discussion about what the documentary does or doesn't include on climate change, or maybe an, anal an analysis of say, the narratives of overpopulation that are often quite prevalent in David Attenborough's documentaries. Um, that's something that this overpopulation narrative is not talked about enough, I don't think, in the public sphere. It's quite harmful to the climate movement and to the people who are most affected by climate change, right? So I have to say as well here with some, tra some transparency that I often find it quite irritating when people like stand up to talk about something and really complain about it and then don't have any solutions for it. And yeah, I don't want to be one of those people, but I, I fear that maybe I am to some extent because I absolutely, like me and Pooja don't have all the answers to this problem. Um, like obviously you will here have many more skills, resources and knowledge relating to school teaching and curriculums than we do. Like that obviously just comes to the territory of you being here. 
Um, and you're the kind of people that we want to look for to for solutions and for actions. So, yeah, people here may one day have some influence over the school curriculums, even if that's just on a very local level. But local levels are still really, really important. And if you are concerned about climate change, then we hope that you can also recognise the importance of acquainting children with these various tools to help them understand and approach the climate crisis within the school curriculum. And if you have any thoughts on this, we would absolutely love to hear them if you're welcome to share them with us as well. Um, so I'm going to hand back over to Pooja to talk a little bit about our handbook and climate emotions. Thanks, Marion. So Marion already mentioned how the one topic that's often sidelined in discussions about the climate crisis is our emotional response to it. So this is what led us to write a handbook for students, which focuses on how to grapple with the complex emotions that we experience as students, whether that's anger, frustration, anxiety, or even grief. And one of the main aims of this student climate handbook was to create a resource for students to help them understand that they're not alone and that climate change has an impact on our mental and emotional well-being. But another important point that we also raise in this handbook is the need to critique educational, cultural and political institutions, because just because an organization appears on the surface to be acknowledging climate change, they can still be very much capable of engaging in greenwashing. So it's really important to employ your critical thinking skills to whatever institution you're participating in. And this particular handbook was written for university students, since both of us are university students, but we're also trying to make it more accessible to high school students. And we, so if anyone in the audience would be interested in helping with the second edition of our handbook, and if you have any other ideas, please do let us know. We would really appreciate it. And I just returning to the point about our petition. So the next steps for our petition is basically to take uh, so there's a, there's a meeting happening on the 9th of february where the city council's resources and governance committee the their scrutiny committee meets and they have a discussion about our petition and whether we, we, we will basically be calling the councillors to recommend a vote in full council. And this is one opportunity for you to engage in our work. So if you would want to know more about this, because I'm really conscious about the time right now, if you want to know more about this and different ways to get involved, please do reach out to us. So our email address is there, but you can also follow us on social media. And just to conclude this talk, we want to emphasize that we don't have all the answers for how schools and educational institutions can create spaces to navigate climate emotions or just to build a more critical curriculum. So we don't have the answers, but we hope that we've raised some really important questions for you because we know that you have the skills, the, no the knowledge and the resources to influence and shape the learning experience of students in coming generations. So we hope that our talk left you with more questions than answers. And thank you once again for inviting us to this remarkable conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Marion. I'd like everybody in the audience, can we use the reaction button on Zoom? And can everybody get on the clap, please? Warm round of applause for, 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 for Pooja and Marion. An extremely thought-provoking uh, talk to kick off this session. Thank you both very much for that. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions um, um, from the audience, guys. So I want, I'm going to, uh, certainly one, maybe two, before we go on to Eleanor. Um, so I'd love to take some questions. Um, from, from the audience, I've got a couple, um, but I feel like I'd be abusing my, my position as chair of the session. So I'm gonna just invite the audience to, to have, a, uh, have a think and suggest a couple of questions. Otherwise I'm gonna abuse my power. Okay, first of all, we'll have a bit more of an extended Q&A at the end of the session as well, but I'm gonna kind of just kind of go back to Pudra and Marin very briefly. Um, it's lovely to hear about the work that you're doing with Climate Emergency Manchester. I love the way that it's very strategic. You're thinking about a clear, concrete objective with having the scrutiny committee put in place. But I also love that you're thinking very uh, carefully about capacity building and nurturing the kind of activists um, in your network. I think that's so important to, to, to raise. Um, but my question, though, to you guys is, is what we've, the audience today is mostly 
uh, teachers or people next year who will be newly qualified teachers. I myself am a newly qualified teacher. How do teachers in the classroom, whether we're biology teachers, maths teachers, maybe a uh, teacher in uh, the social sciences, how could we potentially interact with some of your work at the, at, at the local level? Do you have any ideas or suggestions for that? Uh, well, for a start, we would, we would genuinely absolutely love the input of students, teachers, newly qualified teachers, teachers in training um, for this new edition of the handbook that we're doing. Um, we managed to get like quite a few um, quite like useful I don't want to say connections because that sounds very sort of like networking and like nepotism and that kind of stuff. Um, but we, we managed to get quite a lot of really good reception to the first handbook. And there's quite a lot of people who were working with Manchester Museum on producing it, for example. And there's quite a few people who um, I think would be really, really um, just like throughout different kind of like climate network spheres up for promoting it and for helping to disseminate it into schools. So in terms of like our immediate work that we're doing, that would be a really brilliant way um, for like various people in like across schools and education to help engage with us at a very local level um it's not <laughs> this obviously isn't just be sort of being like please help us like we're trying to promote this thing that we're doing um, but genuinely like we, we we hope that there is some useful resources and tools in there for students that's obviously why we've done it um so that would be the main point i would say or the first thing that springs to mind in terms of how you can engage with what we're doing with schools and with education lovely thank you for that marion um any we're going to take one more question. Um, uh, you guys may have noticed you were in full presenter mode, but the, the David Attenborough uh, comment that you made sparked off a lot of conversation in the chat box. It's been kicking off in the chat box, and I think very healthy discussion and debate about this figurehead, Sir David. Um, and I kind of maybe want a, a final question before we bring in Eleanor is just what other voices or perspectives do you feel we could bring in that complement David, who is obviously a figurehead in, in, in this country. So maybe I'll kind of go to Pooja on that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. For me personally, I think it's really important to bring in voices that have traditionally been marginalized in the environmental movement. So you've got some amazing climate activists, both in the global north and the global south, who have been like working in communities, whether they are communities of color, indigenous communities, or um, even working class communities. I think that they've been doing some fantastic work. And often you do have like you, the 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 mainstream environmental movement still tends to privilege certain voices over the others. And I think that it is our responsibility, both as individuals and as groups, to actively look out for voices. Because it's not like people aren't talking about this. Like, as you mentioned, Greta is often praised for like being at the forefront of the climate movement. But you've got young climate activists all over the world. And Greta herself acknowledges the fact that the media should not tend to like focus on one particular activist. So I think that it's something Something that we need to think about whether it's like following climate activists on social media but also just bringing in different voices in the curriculum because I think that we need to really avoid privileging some voices over the others and as Marion mentioned during the talk as well it's really important to be critical of the media that we consume so yes I think that we have to actively look out for different voices. Amazing thank you so much for that. Pooja, uh, incredibly thoughtful, thoughtful answer. Okay, guys, uh, once again, can we give a big round of applause to, to Pooja and Marion? Get that digital button going. Lovely to see the video of people clapping. It's very, very kind of you. Okay, my friends, let's move on to the um, uh, the, the the end, our final, our final major piece of this conference. And um, I get a little bit emotional about talking about Teach the Future. I'm going to introduce Eleanor from that organization. Um, because they're the reason this conference has happened. Um, about uh, six to nine months, oh, about seven months ago, uh, a, a, there was a group of us in a tutor group in the PGC science course who were wrestling with pupil voice in climate education um, and, and how we can look at pupil perspectives to shape what we do in the classroom and the curriculum. And we discovered Teach the Future. Um, and we reached out to them, we spoke to them, um, and they've come in not only to offer their perspective as a keynote, uh, today in the form of Eleanor, but they've also been very kind of uh, thoughtful and energetic in, in shaping the content of the conference today. So I'm really, really glad that they can kind of have the, the closing notes um, of today's conference. So let me just say a little bit uh, to you about Eleanor. So Eleanor, she's in year 13. She's taking maths, further maths and economics. 
uh, having set A-level politics last year. And she's currently writing an EPQ um, about the Ukrainian-Russia gas industry. Um, but she says that may be a bit harder to explain. Um, she's currently a sixth form student at Ivory Bridge Community College in Devon. Um, and she's been involved with Teach the Future since April 2020. And before that, she was involved in writing uh, Green New Deal works um, uh, in Devon with her local strike group, Fridays for Future, based in Exeter. She uses she and they pronouns. Uh, if we could give a really, really warm welcome to Eleanor. The floor is yours. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. That was a really nice introduction about Teach the Future. Um, and so what I'm going to say is a follows much of the same sentiments that um, Marion and Pooja mentioned. Um, so there's, I think it should hopefully complement um, their talk quite well. Um, I think Xi'an is going to share, there we go. <laughs> Um, I'll just wait for that. Let's get that. Um, that's the first slide. That's the last slide, I think. <laughs> Sorry, apologies for that. <laughs> oh, it's only because my computer wasn't accepting sharing. Well, don't don't lock everyone. <laughs> Spoil the surprise. There we are. <laughs> okay, so teach the future. Um, as I'm sure some of you have heard, is a student-led campaign. Um, well, campaigning for climate education. Um, this comes not just in the form of curric curriculum change, but also in the form of retrofitting school buildings to be net zero, um, and also supporting students who have climate anxiety and empowering them so that they don't feel like they're alone. Um, so I'm sure as you're here today to talk about green climate education, um, you know quite a bit about why the um, curriculum and current education isn't good enough. Um, but here's just a bit of background about why Teach the Future specifically thinks um, the system is currently inadequate. So education around climate change in the UK isn't good enough and students aren't being prepared to face the changes or to understand the solutions. Um, I think the next slide says some of this as well. Um, and so a survey of almost 3000 pupils that was run by SOS UK showed that only 4% of these pupils who are aged nine to 18, I believe, um, felt that they know a lot about climate change. And this doesn't go just for students. It also applies to teachers. I'm getting a bit ahead of, bit ahead of the slides, I'm afraid. Um, it also applies to teachers. And of course, of course students can't feel um, that they know a lot about climate change if the teachers who are there to educate them also don't feel prepared to tackle this subject. Um, and I think a lot of why such a small proportion of teachers um, feel that they can talk about the climate crisis is because it, the climate crisis in the national curriculum is um, confined to science and geography, or at least that is my own experience of it. Um, is one that a lot of people in the campaign share. Um, in chemistry, which is the only science I can remember mentioning it, it's purely just about what gases are in the atmosphere and how this has changed over time. Um, but in geography, they look a bit more about the aspect of it. I don't think there is another slide for this one. Um, it's that one, <laughs> that was wrong. Um, but in geography, one of the memories that sticks in my mind the most from GCSE is them teaching us about Shell in the Niger Delta. Um, Shell um, in Nigeria have a big platform and they have invested a lot in local education, we were told, but that's so that students there can work for Shell. And we were told, we were instructed we had to write balanced arguments for this. We had to write balanced arguments about the oil spills which ruined local people's lives who relied on farming and fishing. But and we had to write a balanced argument about that. And I think that's just one of the things about the climate education in schools currently that just really feels wrong to me that climate, the climate crisis is viewed as something that you can argue about when in reality we need to spend less time saying 
is it bad that Shell spilled lots of oil? <laughs> and more time listening to the voices who have been harmed by it. Um, and so that's my own experience of it. And so climate education needs to be taught as like the golden thread weaving through all of the different subjects because the climate crisis affects all aspects of society. And so in history, you could take, for an example, um, you could study colonialism and its relationship with fossil fuels. So that's how it could, you know, that's how climate education could come into history. And of course, in design and technology, you could look at how sustainable materials and how to make goods last longer so that you get rid of planned obsolescence. And so there's so many different ways that you can combine sustainability and the climate crisis into existing subjects. It shouldn't just be confined to one or two optional subjects. Um, but it's not just the curriculum that needs to change. Um, as is on the screen currently, this is actually a screenshot of my school from a promotional video they hired a drone for. Um, and in the middle of that place, there used to be green space, but um, because of all of the house building in the surrounding areas, um, they've had to build more blocks because the school was oversubscribed. They needed to fit more pupils in somehow. And so the school has changed so much, even just while I've been there. Um, there's so little grass and all the buildings are close together and it just feels cramped. And you can see why students may feel anxious. Um, and so, yes, it's the buildings as well that needs to change, not just the curriculum. Um, the UK is home to a wide variety of, um, of drafty, poorly, poorly insulated and inefficiently powered school buildings, meaning there's a lot that can change. And this is something that disproportionately affects um, those areas that are already disadvantaged. And so schools that are within cities and often poor areas are surrounded by tarmac, which absorbs all of the heat and thus um, heats up all of the um, buildings around it, meaning that the temperatures within school buildings can rise astronomically, reaching over 30 degrees in many days in the summer. Um, pair this with you know, air pollution as well. It's a mystery that any student is able to learn. Um, and so if we can improve conditions within schools, then we not only, um, we not only, sorry, <laughs> we not only teach students how to live sustainably, but we also just improve their ability to learn. Um, a study by King's College London found that green space has also been massively beneficial to children's resilience and therefore academic performance. Um, and you can really see how social justice ties in here because a Public Health England report found that those in the most deprived areas had the lowest access to green space, meaning those who are already worse off, which was often um, people of colour in the UK, um, have lower chances at success purely because they're cut off from the screen space, which really boosts their mental performance. Um, and so if we can incorporate green space both within school campuses and retrofitting, of course, to make school buildings purely more comfortable, but as well as more energy efficient, then we can make education so much more equitable because we can improve standards for everyone to learn. Um, and so it feels like there's a lot of progress that needs to be made, but that's why the campaign is here. And we can change this, which is the next slide. Um, so what is Teach the Future and what are we trying to do? Um, teach the Future is a student campaign that wants to teach about the climate crisis, not to scare students, but to empower and inspire them to take on green jobs and to be the future leaders in finding solutions and sustainable practices. Um, we want to include green skills within vocational courses um, because currently climate crisis is seen as something purely academical. Um, an Aldersgate group report in 2020 found called Upskilling the UK Workforce for the 21st Century showed that the UK faces a deficit in skills which currently undermines the growth of low carbon supply chains across the economy and if we can fix this then we can become a world leader in sustainable technology. Um, 
in then what I mentioned earlier about retrofitting buildings to be net zero. Um, we came up, we worked with a couple of other groups mm -hmm. and we came up with a proposal for the UK government, which found that it would cost 23 billion pounds to retrofit all existing school buildings in England. This was unfortunately, um, didn't include the other nations. Um, as well as ensuring net zero standards for all future buildings. Um, and this is something that can be really important for the comeback from the coronavirus um, for the economy as well, because it means that this funding is spread across, across the nation equitably as it will create green jobs as well. Um, and so it will really boost um, the whole of the country. Um, and so what has Teach the Future done so far? Um, we were launched in October 2019 at a National Education Union Climate Conference. Um, and we were quite small up until um, we wrote a bill. <laughs> we partnered with a couple of lawyers and wrote the English Climate Emergency Education Bill. It is the only bill um, to have been written by students in the UK. And after that, we held a parliamentary reception and we had almost 100 MPs attend it and had um, speeches by MPs and students alike. Um, there is a slide with some pictures of this, I think. That's the bill heading. Yeah, that's the reception. Um, and so getting into COVID and lockdown, um, we looked at the funding that was going to come with um, recovery from lockdown and we pushed for a green recovery for education and this included 1,105 students signing on to a letter to Rishi Sunak calling for a green recovery for education which of course was retrofitting school buildings and making them suitable for the future. Um, and while we were calling for 23 billion pounds investment um, only one billion pounds was announced in the budget. Um, well, this can't necessarily, there's no proof that we can assign this to ourselves and say, this is what we did. It's really good to see that investment there, even though we want to push for so much more. Um, and so since then we have used some of our funding to hire student staff, um, which helps the campaign to be as student led as possible. Um, we have also launched um, nation campaigns in Scotland and really recently Wales as well. Um, Northern, Northern Ireland is in the works. Um, but perhaps most recently um, in the comprehensive spending review, we submitted um, talking about how much it would cost to retrofit um, the existing, existing school buildings, um, which is the 23 billion pound figure I mentioned earlier. Um, and so what's coming next? Um, coming next, we're going to be launching a more public facing campaign as there's only so far we can get with existing politicians. Um, this is going to include a big social media push and lots of petitions that people can sign and ways that individuals can get involved. So this is going to be banner drops and ways to talk to their representatives and MPs. Um, and as the elections come up, especially in Scotland and Wales, but also in local council elections, um, we're in the process of writing pledges that people can sign on to, that councillors can sign on to, um, for them to enforce climate education to the level that they can. Um, and soon we'll hopefully be launching Teach the Future International, which will be an umbrella organization aimed to help support the development of climate campaigns in other countries. We've been meeting with a few campaigners from the Netherlands, um, including a couple of meetings with an MEP. Um, and that's making some really good progress. So it's going to be exciting to see that come public soon, hopefully. Um, in our end goal or hopefully we can work beyond then but our target currently is COP which is going to be in Glasgow and so we're pushing for the UK to make as much change as possible so that they can be a leader in climate education and be made an example of by COP which is a big target and it's getting closer and closer so quickly um, 
that even if we don't fulfill our aims by then, we're still going to try to push for a big press presence around and focus on climate education during it. And so what can teachers do to get involved um, in our campaign? So what's going to come with the launch of our more public facing campaign is a teacher's network. And now this is going to be mostly through social media, probably Facebook, um, but it's going to allow teachers from across the UK to share resources and discuss climate education, as well as feeding back into our campaign. So you'll be able to share any resources you've come across or have made yourselves um, and any changes you've made within your school and how with all sorts of teachers across the country. So even if it's not in the national curriculum, um, you can start making these changes within your own lessons as well, when you have the time, of course. I know how pressed things are towards exams most of the time. Um, so this will be launching in hopefully about a month's time. Um, but to keep up to date and to find out exactly when it's going to launch, you can join our mailing list, which is at teachthefuture.uk or you can follow us on Twitter which is underscore teach the future um, updates will come on either of them um, but yeah that's pretty much all I have to say but the message to take away that I just like want to leave you with is that with broad climate education we can equip generations to come with the skills and knowledge needed for the green jobs of the future and empower every young person to contribute to a more resilient sustainable society Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. I think uh, I'm sure everybody's going to give a very warm round of applause. Pop your videos on, everybody. Let's give Eleanor a really warm, warm round of applause. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we began today with Kevin Anderson asking for a revolutionary change, and we've got a bunch of 16-year-olds writing parliamentary bills. That sounds like a pretty revolutionary activity to me, doesn't it? Okay, folks, we've got time for, for some questions. So I want to have a, a little round for, for Eleanor to, to begin with, and then maybe one or two that possibly Marion and Pooja can come back in as well. So I want to squeeze this in, guys. So um, any thoughts, uh, any questions? Um, lots of love and warmth for you in the chat box, Eleanor. Um, very, very powerful earlier on in the discussion. Your points about green spaces and how that affects well-being and the environmental and the uh, emotional context of that were, were very, very powerful. Lots of people were, were commenting on that. Just going to invite any questions, guys. So I'm going to just briefly, I'm going to put somebody on the spot based on what they said in the chat box and they're going to come in. So just be warned, if you put something in the chat box, I'm coming to you. Um, so I believe it was Alison. She made a little comment. I'm going to bring Alison. Um, it was a little while ago. There's been so many comments that I've got to go pin it down very, very quickly. Um, if your name is Alison, I imagine there's only a handful of you on the call. Be ready, Alison, because um, I'm going to ask you. I want you just to speak a little bit. Hey, Alison, do you want to just come in and just speak to your point in the chat box and, and maybe a question for Eleanor um, uh, about the point that you raised? Oh, we, we've got you on mute, Alison. Sorry, which point was it? Um, yeah, I, be I believe it was about, you, you talked about the evidence base for, for one of the points that Eleanor was making around green spaces. Uh, yeah, so there was a fabulous project, a re research project that was funded by the University of Manchester, which some of you may be aware, aware of called GIA. So it was green um, infrastructure and its effect on mental health and well-being. Um, and the the report was actually produced last year. I think I went to the conference in January just before lockdown. Um, I don't know if anyone else here made that, but um, it was just a really important um, resource for us to use as an evidence base. And I use it quite a lot in all my work. I work with Wigan Local Authority. I'm an environment educator for the council. So that's why I was asking, do you scrutinize beyond the city boundary? Do you scrutinize councils beyond Manchester City Council? Do you scrutinize them in the whole of the Northwest, for example? Um, 
because yet yeah, we sign up to climate emergencies and we make these great declarations, but we need to make sure it's not lip service. Um, and I do my bit within the council, I hope I do anyway. But this project, this research project is really, um, it's a good resource basically, um, and looks at the mental health, wellbeing benefits of green space and how vital it is, um, and looks at what we need those green spaces to be. So we need them to be safe and accessible and what that means in real terms. And actually, that's where the councils need to step in and do their bit. Brilliant. So, Thank yeah, you for that. Alice. It's very just a fantastic resource. So I, I urge you all to just very, very it where you can. And um, I'm going to invite maybe Eleanor, any reactions to the points that uh, Alison made and, and maybe Pooja and Marion want to come in? I know a couple of questions coming through in the chat including some comments to encourage you guys to run for, 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 for prime ministerial and MP positions. Um, I, I think those are serious recommendations. Okay, um, uh, Eleanor, do you wanna come back and maybe respond to Alison's points first and I'll invite Marion and, and Pooja to come in with any thoughts that they've got at the moment. So could Alison just um, reiterate the question slightly or you just spoke a lot about lots of different things. No, I might come in here then just to, to help facilitate this very, very brief. Probably I'm mindful of the time, guys. So I'm sorry to, to speak over anyone. I think this looking for uh, practical examples and the evidence base for how these green spaces are so good for well-being. And I guess what we'd like to maybe tease out, Eleanor, as, as, as a question is any practical examples of you've seen maybe schools who are taking that on board and are doing some, some clever things uh, in response to what you've been doing from Teach the Future in response to the evidence base that Alison has made? Um, so my school has been quite unfortunate. They've had to build several new blocks recently, um, which it hadn't been green space before. It had been a tennis court, I think, the most recent block was built over. Um, but we have a few green verges and recently the sustainability group that I'm part of has taken has kind of has taken part in some of the campaigns run by in, a few environmental organizations I think wildlife trust is one of them um which you email them and they can send you wildflower seeds um which are often very local to your area as well so you get like exactly the right variety um, and so we've done quite a lot of wildflower planting. We made a wildflower patch in the shape of the school emblem, which the head teacher was really happy about. They loved that bit of promotion. Um, but we've also been taking part in um, quite a few tree planting projects. We were supposed to be doing another one in like November, but that got cancelled because of COVID. Um, but all of the just like small green verges that are all fenced off and no one's allowed to sit on for some reason. Um, we've been taking over with tree planting, which has been quite fun because we've invited people in on the weekend. And it's been a really nice activity for people to get involved with um, um, an activity where you can sit next to them planting a tree and talk about all the different things the school could be doing um, as well. Um, and yeah, there's several different campaigns that are um, running projects like this. I think we got a delivery of 400 saplings um, to plant on the school ground. I'll have to ask where they're from. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's lots of little things that schools can do like that to just use up those tiny fragments of space. Thank you for yeah. that. Eleanor. Sorry, Alison, I'm just mindful. I want to get to a couple of other okay, questions. No I'm ever so sorry. I'm ever so sorry. Okay, so Jamie Doherty asks, I'll go back to you this on Eleanor. Um, what can you say to students to encourage them to get involved in climate action in the similar ways to what you do? It's a brilliant question. Um, before I say that, I'm just going to say, I think they probably were from the Woodland Trust. That does ring a bell. Um, the trees, that is. Um, but what I'd say to people is that change can start really small. Like I may be here talking to a hundred people or so, um, but I started off just uh, local strikes. And then I've also a uh, chair, I think we had an election of the eco group in my school. Um, and however much opposition you face, there will, you'll always be able to find maybe one person on your side in, in my school. Um, there's a couple of really supportive teachers who are there to help um, draft applications for solar panel funding when you've asked the head teacher if they'd be interesting, interested in applying for this and they've said oh sure you can go ahead and do it um, which is always what you want to hear when you're in year 11 um, and so even if you're just facing opposition or maybe not opposition maybe just apathy there's 
you're always going to be able to find like one person on your side at least there'll always be someone there however much they're hiding in the shadows cool thank you for that eleanor um okay guys i'm mindful of the time um i kind of want to go on but i'm mindful that you guys have been on this is maybe your fourth zoom of the day so i feel like i'm gonna i'm gonna i want to bring it to a close um thank you for those thoughtful questions um in in the chat box i'm sorry we didn't get to everybody um with your questions uh, once again if we could just give a huge big thank you to both eleanor Pooja, and marion for their thoughtful contributions today that would be warmly received thank you so much guys for giving up your time and i think genuinely inspiring us today